After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. And that's the end of the chapter. Okay. All right, so, full disclosure, some theologians think that this chapter is a continuation of what we just saw before, which is the opening of the sixth seal. Uh, and then some consider it a interlude in the action. Um, it's very, very easy in Revelation to come up with all kinds of outlines and timelines trying to explain what's going on. Uh, but in the end, it really doesn't matter as long as we understand when we read Revelation, one thing in mind, this is the revealing of God's plan for God's people, all of them. This is our history. Right? This is God's message of repentance and belief in the salvific work of Christ. So we see in chapter 7 the sealing of all of God's people. And the seal protects them from what is to come. And then I would rhetorically ask, think about this. Don't answer yet. What do you think the seal is? And what does that mean? do for us. And then it is an interlude in the action is the way I interpret it and most Lutherans, just about every Lutheran is going to interpret it. So this is an interlude. So you have the opening of the sixth seal, seventh seal has not been opened yet. And you have this scene in the throne room. This is the first interlude. There are many interludes. And so here we see the church militant and then the church triumphant. Church triumphant are all of those who have gone to their heavenly rest. Church militant are all us who are still here. So in verse 1, we see these four angels. Uh, we saw at the opening of the sixth seal, we saw the end of the world. The sky vanished. Every mountain was moved from its place. Remember I said that first, that first with all the horsemen and all that, the book of the seven seals, that first sevenfold vision, that's the view of the history of the world from our perspective. We're here in the world and we see war and tyranny and pestilence and famine and death, right? So the next one, we're gonna see a view from heaven, heaven's view perspective of the exact same thing we've already seen. So it makes sense in this interlude, that, okay, we're in heaven now and we're looking and what do we see? We see the four angels holding back all the stuff that's gonna roll up the sky and move the mountains from their place, right? So we see these four angels set at the four corners of the earth, holding back the end of the world until the next actions are completed. So it makes sense for us to see in an interlude what we saw happen here, 
before it happens from this perspective, right? You cut away. It's like watching a Tarantino movie. You see it, these things happen, and all of a sudden here we're up here in heaven now, and all of a sudden that stuff hasn't happened yet, and we're looking down on it. It's very much like a Tarantino movie, come to think of it. Let me use that more. Okay, so calling the four corners of the earth does not imply that we believe the world is flat. Uh, the ancient Greeks knew the world was round. They even calculated the size of the earth with pretty remarkable precision for their day. They were not off that much. Um, these four angels can be thought of um, as the watchers from Jewish apocryphal literature. Uh, the watcher angels, the, they were not fallen angels, but they're angels, they're just different. Um, sometimes they're called watchers. Uh, you could call them the guardian angels, you know, because they're up there watching out for everything. You can look at Isaiah 11, it's Isaiah 11, 12, I think. So Isaiah 11, 12 says, He will raise a single, he will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. I'm just talking about how he, he sets these boundaries. Okay, the four winds should be associated with the four horsemen. So you have these angels holding back the four winds, right? And if you look in in St. Peter's Square at the Vatican, there's actually a bas-relief of all four of the winds, the east wind, north wind, west wind, south wind, uh, in the, that's just a symbol mm -hmm. for uh, like God's power, I guess you could say. Uh, so these four winds could be identified with the four horsemen. So they're holding back the wind holding back, uh, no wind could blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Um, they're holding back this force against nature until the, like when the horsemen get let loose, what that would look like from above, you would just see all this destruction being taken place. So you, you could associate them with the four horsemen from this perspective, that the angels are holding them back, you know, until the seal is opened. You could look at Daniel 7, um, that's what I want. If you look at Daniel, is it Daniel 7 and Daniel 7, 2 and 3, which says, oh, chapter. Uh, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, David saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter, Daniel declared. I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And in the midst, in the mind of a man was given to it, and behold, another, and it talks about these four creatures that sound kind of... Uh, The, 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 all that symbolism, this is an apocalyptic part of Daniel. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is symbolic in nature. And yeah, and you see all this, all this weird stuff. Uh, and the four beasts, those are actually all kingdoms that have conquered. Israel at one time or another. So you have like Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and then the fourth one would be, or actually I added one in there. Uh, somewhere you got to put Greece in there and then the fourth one would be Rome because uh, it is prophecy. Uh, and you can look at Zechariah chapter six, kind of talks about this as well. But anyway, then here... Like I said, you'll really know you really know some Old Testament stuff when you get done looking through Revelation because you need it for all the symbolism. So then, then it says, then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. So another angel. Now is this Jesus? Probably not. 
some people think that this angel is a vision of Christ also, but it's not because we already know that they're going to be sitting there, seeing, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, so the Lamb can't be the angel. But it is different from the other angels we've heard about, but he has a seal of God in his hand, and he has a pronouncement, so this is a herald. This is a herald angel, like the herald angel on Christmas Eve. Right? It's like, okay, why don't you go down first? You appear to the shepherds, and then you tell them to not be afraid before the rest of us show up, because otherwise, you're going to die. <laughs> you're just going to die afraid, right? So one at a time, guys, One this time, one at a time. So why do angels always have to say fear not? Because they're terrifying, they're huge. I actually got a, I, my, I found the bulletin cover image I want to use for Easter, and it's a picture of like the tomb with the rock rumble there, right? But it's like an artist's, like a painting, or like mm -hmm. a sketch or whatever. But the angel is huge. <laughs> he's like, he's sitting like on a rock half the size of the tomb. So it's like, here's people, and then here's this angel that's already enormous. Hmm. It's like, scary looking. Huh? No, he just looks like an angel. But it's like, when you realize, like, he's drawn a lot bigger than everybody else. He's huge. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, because they're supposed to be terrifying. Okay, so this other angel, different from the other angels we've already seen. This is a different one. He's a herald. He has a message, and he has the seal of God in his, head, in his hand. And in Greek, that word for sign is aspraxia. Asphragia in the Greek Old Testament is sign or simian. Say it again. Asphragisa. Does it make the accent in the right place? There's no accent mark. I spelled it wrong. I think it's on the I, so it's yeah, it's S Fragisa. Fragisa. The accent's on the I. So Asphragisa. Which is the word for seal. And then in the Greek Old Testament, the word sign is Simeon. Simeon, sorry, Simeon is long ago. Uh, in Hebrew, the word used there where it says, where in the Old Testament, Greek is Simeon, Simeon. In Hebrew, the word is Ta. And the word Ta is actually a letter, the letter Ta. And the letter Ta just means mark. And before they had Hebrew script, the early, early, early stuff was written in Phoenician, the Phoenician alphabet, actually. And then there's a, a script called Paleolithic Hebrew. Okay, how do you draw the word for sign or seal or ta or mark? How do you write that in Paleolithic Hebrew? It's a cross. It's like a simple forearm equal cross. Okay, so they sealed the servant of God on their foreheads with a seal, a sign. The same one you get when you're baptized. You receive the sign of the Holy Cross on mm -hmm. your forehead and on your heart. So that's the sign. So that's the seal. That's the seal, right? Did it matter what it was? Was it like Christ's blood or ashes or? Water. Baptism. Water. So, yeah. So that's the symbol. That's the seal we receive the seal that protects them from what's coming next. So don't let any of this stuff happen. Don't let these four horsemen loose, because we're from heavenly perspective now. Don't let these four horsemen loose to like just kill everybody, because we've got to make sure that these are sealed first. And sealed is the sign of the cross on their forehead, on their heart. So this is God's people receiving a mark of distinction, setting them apart as children of God. So the more you talk about it, the more it's like, okay, it's baptism, it can't be anything else. Uh, where was the word? I know I read, I read the word. Where did I read the word servant? So, a lot of times in the New Testament, the word bond servant is used instead of 
just servant, to imply there's some kind of price, right? Because a bond servant or an indentured servant, you could sell yourself into indentured servitude. So I, I have a debt, I can't hope to pay it off. You pay my debt off and I am your slave until I pay you back. However long that takes, years of service that you think or is a cool someone else buys you. Or someone else Not sure about how, can they. I think those could transfer, but they probably got complicated really quick. Because usually there's a relationship there was a, almost a client-patient, patron relationship there. Um, what if what if your owner died? Did your debt often often to your family? debt was cleared? Okay. Did, Upon did death, uh, even regular slaves, off, very often if they died, the master died, they not only uh, received their freedom, they received citizenship, they received the name of their master. Oh. So. So how many died under suspicious? Not as many as you think. Yeah. Because those slaves had very good lives. It's not like right. what we think of as slaves in America. I mean, this was a completely different mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. But uh, bond servant is a better translation for servant. Uh, and I think ESB even uses bond servant sometimes. I like slave because a bond servant means you can work off the debt eventually. It's not very Luther, so I like slave. If, if you want to be freed, there's only one person that can free you, and that's the master, right? So if you are a slave of God, no one can take you away from him, right? You so belong to him. Verse 3 has servant in it. Right. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So there's only a couple of... Uh, do not harm the earth to see... Yeah, till we've sealed the servants of our God on mm -hmm. our foreheads, and... In the Greek, it is bond servant, doulos, doulos. Uh, slave is a better translation in context because uh, it means we're God's property. No one can take God's property from him. Uh, and you can look at Ezekiel, beginning of Ezekiel chapter 9 to see that word used a little bit. Then verse 2, from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, so the east, the place of the coming of the glory of the Lord, which comes from Ezekiel, also Ezekiel 43. So Ezekiel sees the glory of the Lord leaving Jerusalem by the east gate. Uh, and in Malachi chapter four, verse two, the Messiah is the son, S-U-N, son of righteousness. So that, that image of this angel, another angel is coming out of the rising sun with the seal of the living God. So coming out of the rising sun, coming out of the glory of the Lord with this seal. Uh, and then verse three, do not harm because the end is not to come until all of God's elect have received his salvation and the work of God in this world is complete, whatever that is. When that work is complete, then the world can end. Jesus can come back, but not before. But we don't know what that is. Because however many he's got planned, that's what's going to happen. <coughs> okay, so verse 4, 144,000. That's 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. So 12 is the number of God's people. That's just what the number 12 sat, uh, stands for. And squaring or cubing a number means intensification. So if you have 12 times 12, that's 12 squared, gives you 144. It means... Okay, 12 means all of, 12 times 12 means, yeah, I really mean all of, mm -hmm. okay, all of them. Times 10, times 10, times 10, I really seriously, truly mean all of God's people, all of them. I really mean it this time, all of them. Mm -hmm. That's what that number means, 144,000. Uh, 10 is the number of completion. So if you have God's people times the number of completion, it's all of God's people. Right? And if you just make that number bigger multiples and powers, that just means, yeah, all of God's people. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it means all of God's people of the old covenant who believed in the promise, like we talked about today in Hebrews, right, in the sermon. All the people in the Old Testament who believed in the promise of the Messiah to come, and it, by faith, they were saved by their faith in the Messiah to come, that God would keep that promise. And all the people like us who now look back to Jesus' work on the cross, and we have faith that he is truly risen from the dead 
and in faith we have eternal life. So you have God's people of the Old Covenant and all of God's people of the New Covenant. Which is why you had 24 elders in the beginning. When they see around the throne, you have 24 elders on their thrones casting their crowns in front of them and praying. 12 from the Old Covenant, 12 from the New Covenant, 12 patriarchs, 12 apostles. And from them came all of God's people. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses use this for their proof text of how many people will be in heaven. Mm -hmm. The rest of God's people get the new earth, but the really, really elect, the super elect, the elite, super good Jehovah's Witnesses get the new heaven. And that's only 145,000. So only the best get the live of God in heaven. But 144,000, that's all it means is all of God's people. Then verses 5 to 8, which we hear as an optional reading, but I always read it anyway. Uh, that's for the last Sunday of the church or is All Saints Day. It's All Saints Day. It's the second reading. So the 12 tribes, it's, it's always a trick question, so I always ask it. You look at those 12 tribes in that list. Are those the 12 tribes of Israel? And you know when the teacher asks you, are that the 12 tribes of Israel? The answer is probably no. Okay. Now you look at, and I can give you guys a chart, which I'm selfishly hoarding over here in the corner. But you can look at, I'll be getting copies of this. You can, uh, if you look at Genesis chapters 29 and 30, it gives you the list of the 12 tribes of Israel. Then in Numbers chapter 1, you have a second list, and that one is different because by Numbers chapter 1, instead of doing this from memory, I'm actually going to read my notes so I don't say it wrong. So the order of the tribes is different in Revelation, and you remember you had Jacob, Israel, right? Jacob, Israel had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes, and that's Genesis 29 through 30. The 12 became 13 when Jacob gave Joseph a double portion, right? Which meant that Ephraim and Manasseh each became tribes. Okay, so then you'll see in my little chart, Joseph goes away and Ephraim and Manasseh get added. But Levi did not get land, right? The Levites were the priestly tribe. They lived off the tithes of the other 12. So you take them off the list, right? And because the old company, and so you take them off the you take them off the list. And now you have, you know, Reuben, Simeon, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Ishakar, Zebulun, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. But, oh yeah, then you get to Revelation 7 and you got to take Dan off because Dan fell into idolatry and they ceased to be. That's Judges 18. Um, and Ephraim, for their being in league with Dan's idolatry, also ceased to be. That's Judges 17 and 18. Uh, the Old Testament lists are in order of birth. They're always, those lists were always in order of birth. The list in Revelation puts Judah first for the obvious reasons that Jesus comes out of the tribe of Judah. So he's listed, Judah is listed first. Oh, and you can put Levi back in because now you don't need priests because Jesus is the great high priest. You don't need priests standing, making sacrifices. It's next Sunday's epistle reading. Um, you don't need the priests anymore. You don't need the sacrificial system. Jesus had the once for all sacrifice so the priests don't got to stand there all day doing sin offerings. So they can now own land or whatever, symbolically. So all the tribes that did not hold to God's promises, right, are removed. But it is not literally talking about the, twi the, tri the tribes. It's not literally talking about the tribes because it's still symbolic that that this is all of God's faithful. Uh, unbelievers don't receive the seal because they are set apart. And that clues us in because it says, from every tribe of the sons of Israel, which 
Those aren't the sons of Israel. If you strictly read the sons of Jacob, right? Whose new name was Israel. So it's cluing you in that, yeah, something's going on here. We're not supposed to literally take this as the actual 12 tribes. And if we don't, this is where you get, if we don't preserve Jerusalem and then Israel and Jesus is going to come back even forgetting that there's only one tribe left and that is Judah, right? All the other ones are actually gone. Okay, the there was a misinterpretation back during the early church fathers. This is like the couple generations after the apostles. It already began a misinterpretation of the absence of Dan, why that was. They held that the Antichrist was going to come out of the tribe of Dan, and that's why it was off the list. That they you know, not only didn't follow God's promise, but that's where the Antichrist was going to come out. Uh, which maybe is kind of neat for some kind of movie plot. Uh, there's no basis for that in Scripture. The tribe of Dan left the way of God way, way, way early on. Like I said, that's Judges 18. Um, one significance of showing it like this was 144,000 in groups of 12,000. You can picture them, especially if you're like a Star Wars fan, when the Clone Wars, right, when they were when they were having all the clones made and they were, you saw them, they were looking down to all the soldiers who were just getting ready to ship out and there were just ranks upon ranks upon ranks of them all lined up in battle formation to get loaded on the ships. That's what this image is. This is an image of the church militant in battle formation. The church militant is us. We are in the church militant. So we're here fighting the fight until Jesus comes back. This is like onward Christian soldiers. That is where all of this comes from. Uh, and our marching orders are share the word of Christ to the world so that everyone can be a part of this 144,000. Uh, not necessarily to fight. You know, don't go out and rage holy war, wage holy war. You know, we're not calling for crusades. Uh, but you are supposed to defend the ramparts of the castle. Make sure it doesn't get run over. So the symbolism of the numbering and the naming of the tribes, that would have been obvious to the people John's writing to, um, not to us, because we don't know all this Old Testament stuff like they did. Well, I mean, I've taught this like a number of times, and I still couldn't do this from memory. I have to look at the notes. I go, yeah, that's in Judges somewhere, but what chapter? I don't know. Uh, we don't know this stuff nearly as well as the first century Christians would have. The good news is the Romans had no clue what any of this stuff means. So John sends out a scroll. It's got to get to the mainland and distribute it to the churches, right? Because that's how this works. And the Romans might intercept it and they'll be like, what's this? And they'll open it up and they'll see all these Jewish names on it. And they're going to go, yeah, it's just more of that Jewish cult, that new one. You know, it's okay. Just let it go. You know, it's not seditious. They're not plotting to overthrow Rome. That's all they cared about. You know, so as long as it was in that coded language that looks just like all the other Jewish stuff that's floating around, including other apocalyptic literature that these people love, plus scripture, they're just going to go, yeah, it's just some that weird group of Jews. Because the Romans didn't know what Christians were yet, really. They just knew there was this new sect. They seemed to be really nice to each other, but you know, they're just weird Jews. So that kept all of those churches safe. And that's how John was keeping these churches safe by writing everything in code. I mean, did he have to write all this stuff in the apocalyptic language? No, he didn't have to. I mean, maybe that's what the visions he saw like that. Well, yeah, he had to do it that way, but you know, he could have written it differently. He didn't have to write it in such symbolic language, but it does help keep them safe being in code. So then verses 9 through 17, not to speed through it, but it speeds through pretty quick. That is the elect now joining. This is an interlude, so there's, there's all of God's elect being sealed. Now what happens after God's elect are sealed? After all of the people that are going to be saved are saved, now the world can end. Jesus can come back. So... 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. And after this, all the sealing's done. After this, now I saw great 
multitude that no one can number, which is our clue that it's not a literal 144,000 from every nation, etc., and so forth, and they're all standing in front of the Lamb, in front of the throne. So now we go from the church militant, time ends, world ends, church triumphant. The elect joins with the angels and all the company of heaven, and they start singing the new song, or the continuation of the new song that started a couple of chapters ago, the great to deum, laudemus, the great to the God, God we pray, the God we praise. Uh, palm branches are a symbol of victory. Uh, so this vision looks very similar to the triumphal entry of Jesus, right? Except now this is the triumphal entry of all God's saints into heaven. Uh, this waving of palm branches actually came from uh, the first Hanukkah. So if you read in the Apocrypha, in the books of Maccabees, when the first Hanukkah is celebrated, the Festival of Lights, that is where the whole concept of waving palm branches in victory as a symbol of victory comes from. And then the word Hosanna, again, means now save us. So in this vision, we see the palm branches being waved, all of these people we see, salvation has been accomplished, and it's proclaimed in heaven by the elect themselves. And they sing the great Te Deum. Uh, so verse 12, and other verses, verse 12, that's where this is the feast comes from, in divine service setting one. I don't think we've ever done one since you've been here. Doesn't sound familiar. Yeah. This is the feast. Anyway, so it's this hymn that some people don't like. It's actually in the Lutheran hymnal, the 1941 one. It's, mm -hmm. it's in there too. Mm -hmm. But people don't realize this because it's in the front with all the canicles and collects and stuff without music. Mm -hmm. So it's just the words, but it's actually there. Uh, and it comes from here. This is where it comes from. Okay, so verse 14. The elder asks John, who are these clothed in the white robes? And John said to him, well, you know, I mean, you're here. I always like to tease people that that's John talking to himself. It's like, hey, young feller up from earth, who are these guys? And John recognizes himself and says, well, you know, I don't know, but you know, because you know, because there's no time. It's fun to think about. I, I mean, technically, I think it could happen, but yeah. There's another guy that likes that idea, and I kind of ran with it. It's like, yeah, that's pretty funny. Okay, hey, don't ask me. You know who they are. And he goes, yeah, I know who they are. They're the ones coming out of the Great Tribulation. They've washed their robes. They've made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You know, this is everybody who has died in faith in Christ. They're now standing before the Lamb of God in heaven. And then verses 16 and 17, we read it at every funeral. If I don't read it at your funeral, I'll read it graveside in the cemetery. Always we read this. So you kind of see our history right there in this one chapter. That's why it's an interlude. Because look at everything that happened. Okay, the world is going to fall apart and the world is going to end. But don't do it till all my people are, are good. And now my people are good. Now go ahead. All right. So now, oh, hey, everybody's in heaven, and we're all praising God, and everybody's been sealed, and they're serving before the throne day and night, never going to hunger and thirst anymore, and everything's good. End of chapter. And then we get to, finally, now, the seventh seal. And I was wrong, it's not the trumpet angels, it's the censer angels, the incense angels. No, it is the seven trumpets, I was right. So you're going to get to chapter eight next week when the Lamb finally opens the seventh seal. So we just have this like flash thing. And it ends, you could take chapter seven out, stick it someplace else, it wouldn't change anything. Mm -hmm. That's the way these parts work. Like I said, it's like a Tarantino movie. It's probably a good way of thinking about it. All right. Hmm. Questions, comments? That's all we're going to do today. There's a lot of pretty interesting stuff packed in that chapter.
preview. Chapter 8, I think, talks about, yeah, the seven angels who stand before God with the seven trumpets. In uh, tradition, there are seven archangels. There are only two archangels mentioned in the Bible. Only one is actually called an archangel. So you have you know, Gabriel and Michael. Gabriel, right, is God is my strength, and Mike A-L is who is like God. L means God. So you have seven archangels in tradition, and by tradition I mean Book of Enoch. That's where it comes from. Unfortunately, Azrael is only in Islam. What did I tell you? They had a new video. Oh, Warner Shore. Oh, really? Yeah. So they came up with a new idea because they're like, well, how are we going to top that last song I did? Mm. They're like, we'll make the choruses breakdowns. It's like every chorus is a breakdown. It's sick. Guy's voice is nuts. <laughs> <laughs>